Thank you. <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, again, Father, it's a great joy and a pleasure we come before you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that we had that right and we had that privilege because we are sons and daughters of God. So, Father God, we come to worship you, to praise you. Father, to submit unto you and to yield to you, Father God, because you are the Almighty God, the God of all creation. And you're our Heavenly Father. So, Father God, we come to love you and to thank you for you, your great and wonderful gift of eternal life. Father, we thank you for the gift of life here on the earth. Father, we thank you, Father God, for what you've done for mankind, what you're going to do, what you continue to do, Father, in the name of Jesus. So as we come before your throne of grace, Father God, Hebrews 4 and 16, boldly, because we love you and we know that we belong to you and you're our Heavenly Father and we're your sons and daughters. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. And Father, we thank you that you meet every need according to your riches and glory by and through Christ Jesus, Philippians 4 and 19. So Father God, I thank you today that even as the word goes forth, that I expect the Holy Spirit to move with signs and wonders on people, Father God, whatever need they have, physical need, financial need, whatever, the Holy Spirit is moving, Father God, and I thank you, Father God, that the Holy Spirit is ever present, like in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, where the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the deep, waiting for a command. So, Father God, we give forth your word in Jeremiah 1, 12, the Holy Spirit watches over your word quickly to perform us. And, Father, we thank you for all this wrought and done this day. Father God, we give you all the praise and the glory. We thank you for the gift of eternal life. We thank you for sending Jesus Christ into this earth to pay that price for Adam's transgression, Adam's sin. We thank you, Father God, for loving us so much. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for being obedient. An obedient son. You emptied yourself out. Philippians chapter 2. You became as a man. And you you paid the price that you paid a price you didn't know. We owe a price we couldn't pay. So, dear Lord Jesus, we accept what you did for us. We accept you as Savior, Lord, Healer, Redeemer, Deliverer, Baptizer, and Holy Ghost, and soon coming King. Therefore, we acknowledge you, Lord Jesus Christ. You are the head, and we're part of your body. So as you give us directions this day and every day, Lord Jesus Christ, and I give you permission to have the Holy Spirit speak boldly through me, you said, John 16, 13, that how be it, when he, the Spirit, through this come, that he would lead you and guide you into all truth. He will show you things to come. So we thank you, Father God, for the Holy Spirit and his ministry. Holy Spirit, we welcome in this place that you may move and manifest yourself severally as you will. And Father God, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, we do covet the best gifts in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 14, 1, Father, we desire spiritual gifts. So, Father God, in Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. <clears throat> well, I believe we're going to continue uh, on what is man. In fact, this morning, I about 6 o'clock, I may have to change my message here in the middle. Uh, I kept hearing a song come up, Let the Church Arise. And uh, going, I've heard that song before. It's been some while ago, I think it is, but... But then I, I was going back to Exodus, uh, Ezekiel chapter 37 about the Valley of Dry Bones. We may go that way today. I don't know. but <laughs> Going this way first, I think. But we, we've been dealing with what is man. And we were our main text we started off with last, uh, two weeks ago and a week before that was in Acts, Psalm chapter 8, starting with verse 3. It says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, not of his hands, of his fingers, the moon, the stars, which you ordain, what is mine, man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than God. Actually, the word, some translations say angels. That's wrong. It's El, the word there is Elohim, which means God, plurality. And uh, you have crowned him with glory and honor. You made him to have dominion. Man is supposed to have total dominion over the work of, his, of God's hands. You put all things under his feet. That word all means all. If you do a study, one guy, I remember at Raymond one time, did a study on all. It means all. All it includes everything, and uh, it says uh, uh, the sheep, the oxen, every beast of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and everything that passes on us over to sea. Our our Lord, our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Well, we remember we went back to to Genesis chapter one, verse twenty six. It said, "Let us create man in our image." So man is human. Mankind is the exact image of Almighty God. It came from inside of God. God is the architect. God is the designer of mankind. And if we just start teaching a little bit last last Wednesday night on the human body, because we're on teach on healing in a certain area, especially cancer, because uh, uh, cancer is number two killer in in in, in the America, the world, actually, the America, but especially. But but uh, God God designed every cell. Every, everything's so unique. I mean, was it Psalm one thirty nine? It says, you were fearfully and wonderfully made. See, God says, I knew you in the womb. 
So God made everything exact. Your skin, your, your organs, your glands, tissues, cells, muscles, the ligaments, every minute thing God ordained, God created. Well, when he created Adam, Adam was supposed to be his son, a created son. Well, Adam only had one thing to do, guard the garden, keep the, keep the evil out. Well, Adam didn't know evil because there was no evil that he was aware of because you wouldn't find out until he ate of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which he was told not to do. Well, we know that uh, when uh, Adam had told that to Eve, because Eve wasn't there when God instructed man. God made, made Adam first. And when he made Adam, he said, now these things you have, all is yours, everything in your control, one thing, everything you have here to eat, but that one thing, don't eat it. For the, the day you eat it, you will die. Well, we know that Adam didn't die the day that he partook of that physically, but he died spiritually. The Bible talks about two kinds of, well, actually three deaths, but two kinds of deaths. Spiritual death, which is separation from God, and that means taking on Satan's nature, and also then later on physical death, which God has never ordained. God didn't ordain man to die. Man, man was created to be eternal. Until, until Adam sinned, there was no time. It was just eternity, like it, was, like it is in heaven right now. And it was, as we can see through Revelation, there's a time when this new heaven and new earth was coming down, Revelations, and all those things are going to pass away. Well, God created man to refill this earth. And then God was going to come down and abide with his children. Like he walked with Adam every day in the cool of the day. God wanted fellowship. So he created a son. Well, that son disobeyed. And that caused uh, a breaking of sonship. He's no longer a son of God. He's a creation of God now. So it took the second Adam, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the last Adam is also called, to undo and take away and destroy everything that Satan has done. Well, we see that when man had authority, when he relinquished that in Genesis chapter 3 there, we see that Satan is now the god of this world, little g, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And we also see, and we can go to back to the book of Job, Job chapter 1, I think it's verse 6 and 7, when the angels of God came before God, that's in the second heaven, God's in the third heaven, you understand. Satan was along with them. God said to Satan, where have you been from patrolling the earth? You can't patrol something you don't have. Luke chapter 4, verse 6, 6 and 7, it said when after Jesus had been tempted 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. Then he came out, the devil tempted him then. Well, the first thing we know with the turn the stone into bread, and then also the, the pinnacle of the temple, you jump off there, God, give his angels charge over you, you don't even dash your foot against a stone. Well, that, But Jesus kept saying to him, it is written. Well, then in verse 6 he said, now if you will bow down and worship me, he took him on the high pinnacle, the uh, king of the mountains, show him all the, the kingdom of the, or the earth. He said, all this will I give you if you'll bow down and worship me. I'll give you the power and the glory because they were given to me. Who gave them to him? Adam. Adam had it. Adam lost it. But we see that Jesus took it back. Colossians 2.15, he destroyed. He, dis he disarmed principalities and powers, made an open show and spectacle of them. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. He said, I am he that liveth. I died, but I'm alive forevermore. I took away the keys of hell and death. Well, we also see in Hebrews chapter 2, I think it's verse 13, that Jesus destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. So death has no legal right to you unless you yield to death. Psalm 91, 16, God said, with long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. So it's to, to who's satisfied? Not God, you. So death has no legal right to a person unless we don't know our rights, unless we don't abide by what the Word of God says, then the devil will come in and play havoc in a person's life. So all these things God had established with man and for man, the man should rule and reign. Well, man had a fall. So therefore, it took Jesus, the second Adam, to bring things back into mankind's hand. And we, we said some things last week. I, we're not going to go over everything because it would be too long. But we, we gave you also the what God expected of you, what God expects of mankind, because the same thing he expects from you is what he expected of Adam, to have dominion. In fact, in Luke's Gospel, I think chapter 19 and verse 13, Jesus said, they were given a parable, occupy until I return. Well, Adam was supposed to occupy the earth until it was full, refilled, then God would come down with mankind. But man messed up. So God expects you and I to occupy. We have the same authority now we can see in Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus gave the keys to the kingdom 
to the church where he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. So that means the curse, every sickness, every disease, poverty, lack, death, all those things are a curse. They're an abomination to God. They, they weren't supposed to be, but because of sin, the wages the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So God had ordained, and God expects now man, means Jesus took back from the devil, gave the authority to the believers. In fact, if we go, let's, okay, we might as well go. Let's go to uh, Ephesians real quick. I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's okay. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 starts with, it says, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom, revelation, the knowledge of him that the eyes of your understanding or your spiritual man, your spiritual eyes, being in line that you may know. God expects you to know. Not Well, I'm not quite sure. No, no, no. He says you're supposed to know. What is the hope of his calling? Where are we at, where are we at here? And, and, and the riches of his glory and inheritance to the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? See, if you believe, if Christ is your Savior, the power has been given, pointed to you and I, given back to us. He said, according to that power, mighty power, which he wrought when he raised Christ from the dead, uh, and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this age, but that which is to come. Put all things under his feet. He's the head and we're the what? Body. So, in other words, the curse, Satan, demons, evil spirits, where they re positionally at under our feet see when god created lucifer in the beginning he was the most beautiful of all the archangels you read through exodus chapter 14 or excuse me isaiah 14 and ezekiel 28 it'll give you a description of what lucifer looked like and who he was but when he fell kicked out of heaven because he exalted himself he lifted up in pride in his beauty but what happened he said i'm gonna exalt my throne over the so he had a throne he had a kingdom here he said, I'm going to exalt my throne above Almighty God. Well, that didn't work very well, so he got kicked out. Then God created man. Now, he gave man complete dominion. So here's Satan looking. God created this creature, this human being. Now, he has more authority than I do. So what's he want to do? He wants that authority back. So what's he do? He tempts man. Well, he didn't tempt man. He tempted a woman. Remember, it was a chick. <laughs> That's what he said. Adam said, God said Adam, will you die? It was a chick. He said, what you gave me? What did, what did you say? It was the devil. He's what passed the buck. He's the one that did it. He deceived me. Well, Adam, Adam knew exactly what was going on. He had authority to kick the devil out, but he stopped it. He didn't do it. So man was put in charge. Man was man had given the specific instructions. Eve didn't have those instructions. She just heard it from Adam. Adam knew. So when he fell, Satan took over. So it took a second Adam, Jesus Christ, to defeat the fallen being who was in control of the earth. So Satan had a, Adam had a lease in the earth. So Satan is still the God of this world right now to a point over the natural things. But you and I have superiority over him and his kingdom. Remember in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God and pulling down to strongholds. See, we, oh, that's not second, second Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. Excuse me. That's wrong. <laughs> Got ahead of myself. Ephesians 6 and 10 on talks about putting on the whole armor of God and what those what the armor is and those weapons are that we have. And uh, every one of them refers to the word of God. So we have authority in the earth. We have authority over situations and circumstances and control. In fact, uh, I think it was two weeks ago. Maybe it was three weeks ago. I don't remember right now. It was one of those weeks. I because Not only do you have control, as God said in Genesis, in Psalm chapter 8, and now Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28, over dominion over everything. That also means the elements we gave you in Mark's gospel. There's, of course, you can read Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account of when Jesus was sleeping in the hind, hinder part of the ship. I think it was Mark chapter 3, I believe it was, around verse 50-something, 48 or 50. And uh, the storm rose up, and, and the disciples, now Jesus has said, go to the other side. That should have been their command. So he's back arresting. They wake him up and say, Master, Master, don't you care? We're perishing. I mean, the boat's taking all water. And uh, he said, 
where is your faith? And he goes another translation, where, but where, why, where, you have little faith. So how so you have no faith? He rebuked the wind and the waves. Now, he didn't rebuke the wind and the waves as the Son of God, as deity. He rebuked him as a man anointed the Holy Ghost in power. Remember, Jesus said, the works that I do, you'll do it even greater. See, see people say, well, that, that was Jesus. Yeah, that was Jesus as our example. That wasn't Jesus in the second position of the Trinity, second person of the Trinity. He didn't operate in the earth that way. He had to empty himself out. He had to be in the earth as a man. He had to take back the keys as a man. God gave it to Adam. As, God's not an Indian giver. So for God to get back into the earth in authority and control again, he had to do it through a man, a man whose spirit was alive unto God. Well, then we know that when Jesus bore our sins on the cross, he became sin who knew no sin. The Bible says he was obedient even unto death. Well, he, in, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9 in the Cambridge Bible, in the little Hebrew, it says, in his death, but it says in his deaths, plural. Jesus died two deaths. Spiritual death, which is separation from God. Remember, my God, my God, why has you forsaken me? But he died a physical death, second. Just like Adam. Adam died a spiritual death first, physical death second. Jesus went into hell three days, three nights, came out of there. God said, this day have I begotten you in Hebrews chapter 1. Today you are a son to me again. Then he gave, so now because of what Jesus did, we see that we are now sons and daughters of God. We went back to Galatians chapter 4 and says, because, and you read from verse 4 through 6, I believe it is. The God, at the appointed time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, to come into the earth. And when Jesus dethroned Satan, then now we become sons and daughters of God. When we accept Jesus Christ as Savior, we have the spirit of adoption. What? The Holy Spirit, who God places what? Within you. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's what? He's a new creature, new creation, one that never existed before. That means... Your body didn't change, but God places a new spirit within you when you accept Jesus Christ. You now become a child of God. See, the rest of the people, anybody that's not born again is a creation of God. And I've said before, you've heard people say, well, we're all God's family. No, we're not. If you're not a child of God through the new birth, you're the creation of God. You're not his child until you accept Christ. Then you are transformed from spiritual death into spiritual life. That's why Paul said, I think it was in Romans chapter 7, verse 9, Paul said, I was alive once. The law came in and I died. Well, he didn't die physically. He died spiritually, as every person does when you have to be a certain age. I don't know what that is. I always, I don't use that as a doctrine, but I see in the Old Testament, 20 years of age was the age of accountability. I don't know. I don't, don't take me. I'm just saying this is where I see it in the Old Testament. But once you get to be a certain age, like young kids, when they perish or die, their spirits go right back to the Father. But when you get to be a certain age, then you die spiritually. Like Paul, like Paul said, I was alive once, then I died. Well, he didn't die again physically, he died spiritually. Paul was born again on the road to Damascus. See, it, that's why Jesus said, John 3, 3 and John 3, 7, you must be born again. Well, when I heard that the first time from Billy Graham, really <laughs> pronouncing it, it turned me off. And I walked away. I uh, just gave my karate class a, a break. I was one, uh, in the room where I had TV on there, and, and uh, Billy Graham was on. I heard that. I turned around and walked away. I thought, I go to church every Sunday and holiday. What, what's this born? I don't hear that from the pulpit, born again. But the day I got saved after Christ, sir, and in September 17th, seemed to be a date that's kind of familiar. 19, <laughs> yeah, 1979. And uh, I think I remember that date for some reason. I don't know. Anyway, anyway, but that's the day I heard the voice as I went to the bathroom. I mean, I, I was driving out to the test track, and, and all of a sudden, a cloud came in the car, and I started crying. Now, guys don't cry. I'm a black belt. I have a karate, karate schools. I lift weights and stuff. And I'm, I'm, wind don't cry. But see, I didn't know the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. <laughs> but anyway, I, 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 I turned the car off. I ran to the bathroom, got on my knees, and I heard Billy Graham's voice. It was like a cheap recorder. 
you must be born again. I'm going, what? But then he, I heard this. Now this is different. I hear he's, I come out of here. It says, you've never accepted my son as your Savior and Lord. Well, I did right there in the bathroom. But see, so I, I, but I had given the Lord permission some time before that. I said, God, I've been in church all my life. I don't know that you're real, but I don't, I don't doubt it. But I, I don't really know that you are that you are real. I mean, I, I, if you, I, if you're really real, I give you permission to manifest yourself. Well, He did, but I gave him permission to do that. I was, I mean, God, I look around. You must be real, but I don't know. I don't know. So anyway, when God created, when God created man and gave him all the authority, and and we and we saw what Jesus had said to us in. The, uh, John's Gospel, the 14th chapter. We might as well read it. <sighs> See, God the Father, God the Son, and definitely God the Holy Spirit expect us to do what Jesus says, and what the Father says, and what we're, we're, we're commanded to do. So, John 14 and 10, Jesus said, Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. But the Father with, who dwells within me, he does the works. So let's go back to John chapter 5. I went too far back. I'm back in Matthew. Oops. John. Come on, John. John chapter 5, verse 19, I believe here. Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, whatsoever he sees the Father do, the Son will also do in like manner. Now, that's verse 19. Now, let's do verse 30. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Now, go back to John 14 again. John 14, verse 12. Jesus said, most assuredly, or barely, barely, truly, truly, I say to you, that who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do, and even greater works, because I go to my Father. So remember when Jesus said to the disciples in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49, and Acts chapter 1, verse 8, wait until you are clothed with or empowered by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so once a person is empowered, God expects you and I to do the same works that Jesus did. The same works that Adam was supposed to have done in the very beginning, have complete dominion, control, and authority. So God has empowered you and I to bring forth the gospel, the good news, but he also empowered us over the situations in our own lives. God doesn't, God doesn't expect us just to lay around and be defeated. We're supposed to be victorious. I can do all things through Philippians 4 and 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So if Christ does that, God has already empowered us then. We're supposed to do what Jesus said to do, what Father said to do. Paul said, and I have, have these written down here somewhere. If I get, I'll give them to you. I probably won't turn to all of them. But Paul said, uh, yeah. Well, all right, let's, let's, let's do, I want to read a few of these things. Need to. Let's go to Ephesians. Back to Ephesians, chapter 2. One, here's, here's a good, very good reason again why. Verse 6. Verse 5 says, Even when we were dead in trespass and sin, he made us alive together with Christ. He, once you're born again, He made you alive. That you've been saved by grace. You've been saved. Verse six, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in what heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Then verse ten. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what good works. We're supposed to keep doing the good works. What did Jesus do? Go back to Matthew chapter four, verse twenty-three and twenty-four. After Jesus came back and was tempted. He came back, he would teach, preach, and heal wherever he went. That's God expects you and I do the same works because he's the head, we're the body. He's the example we're supposed to follow. In uh, Philippians chapter 2. Verse 
Verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to what? Do his good pleasure. So Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. I and whom the children had been given unto me are for signs and for wonders. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 13. Again, the children had been given to me for what? Signs and worth for signs and wonders. God expects the things to happen around us and through us. We've been empowered. We have the word of God. We have the name of Jesus. God expects sin. He's coming, Jesus is coming back for a glorious church without spot and a wrinkle. He doesn't expect you and I just to sit around and oh, do this. Well, I can't do that. No. He expects us to do what he says to do. It's not when we do things in his name, we're not doing it on our own accord because we're instructed to do these things. He said, Mark, this is for everyone, not even if you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. Mark 16, 18, or 17, first of all. These signs shall follow or accompany those. See, if you're a believer, signs are supposed to follow you. We just give you signs and wonders in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. In my name, they'll do what? They'll cast out demons. They'll speak in new tongues. Verse 18, if they drink any daily poison, it won't hurt them or harm them. They're not supposed to go around drinking poison on purposely, but uh, uh, verse 18, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So we get people the word, get the word into them, lay hands on them. That, 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 that's a, there's no transferring of power there. <clears throat> it's, a, it's just a point of contact. Brother Hagin said when he before he got filled with the Holy Ghost, as a Baptist minister, for three years, he got more people healed in his ministry than three Pentecostal preachers who had been baptized in the Holy Ghost. Because they kept waiting for the Holy Ghost to move, Brother Hagin would what? Teach the Word. So as he taught the Word, people believed it. Signs followed because God performs His Word. The Word works. The Word always works. We have to work the Word. If you don't work the Word, it won't work. That's why we have to confess the word, act on the word. See, a lot of times people, whether you're prayed for or you're believing for something, they maybe accept a prayer, but they don't do anything about it. They don't confess it. They don't speak it out. They don't act on it. James said faith without corresponding action is dead. There's, no, there's nothing happening. So you can have the faith to be healed, but never get healed. The faith, see, you have to, it's mine, I take it now. But I don't feel like it. Your body's going to tell you all kinds of things. It's going to tell you when you're tired, when you're hungry, when the weather's bad outside, it's dark and gloomy out. People are body ruled. What their body tells them, that's what they do. I'm tired. I'm going to lay down. Well, sometimes, I mean, you do need to lay down sometimes, but the Bible says in Proverbs, you know, the sluggard, if he lays down all the time, you're going to go to poverty. You're going to go to, you starve to death. We're supposed to be doers of the word and act upon it. In fact, uh, in the... Uh, I'll get there in a minute. Okay. Let's go back to uh, Philippians, or Philippians, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. I just want to lay some scriptures out there that you need to realize who you are in Christ Jesus, who you are as a child of the Most High God, and what is available to you and for you we don't have to be beaten and broken down and whipped. We're supposed to be warriors. We're supposed to be a good soldier in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Uh, yeah, I guess 16. He says, Therefore I urge you to imitate or follow me. In, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. So what did Paul, well, go and see what Paul did through the Gospels. Prayed for the sick, cast out devils. I mean, that's what we're supposed to be doing. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, then Philippians, Philippians, back to Philippians. 3 and 17. Brethren, whoop, that's not it. Where's it at? Where's it at? I copied it down wrong here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Yeah, well, yeah, somebody. Rather than join, join, join in following my example, and note these which are so, who so walk uh, as, a, as a pattern. So again, Paul's saying, imitate closely me as I closely imitate Christ. Well, I heard Brother Copeland say this years ago, but <clears throat> he said, people said, the way you act, you act like a bunch of little Jesuses. Well, what do you think the word Christian means? See, we're Christ followers. Christian, we're Christ-like. We have that anointings from God. We're supposed to be doing the same works. Jesus said, the works I do, you will do. If you're a believer, we're supposed to do it. So back to uh, Matthew. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until the kingdom of, kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. God, this is spiritual now, God expects you to get violent spiritually and take back what belongs to you and I. He said, because the devil keeps trying to steal the kingdom from you and I and the things of the kingdom, the promises, the blessings of the kingdom, he said, the violent take it by force. We got to violently in the spiritual realm, take it back. He said, tell the devil, no. In Jesus' name, I refuse that. But see, but most time people say, well, I guess, I don't, I guess it was God's will. No, 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 no. His word is his will. Yeah, but God's teaching me something. No, you might learn, but God doesn't teach you. He teaches you by his word and through the Holy Spirit. You may, you may learn through your tests and trials, and you're supposed to. You, you should. But God didn't put you in there. We got there by our tongue, the way we think in our head. But if we've been given 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, as I started this quote before there, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Well, see, we have all kinds of weapons. We have the name of Jesus, the word of God. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the gifts of the Spirit of our, at our disposal. So we are supposed to do something to help other people to keep enlarging the kingdom. As God told Adam, replenish the earth, refill the earth. God wants the earth filled with born-again sons and daughters of God, children of God. That's what he wants. That's why Jesus, people say, well, we want the rapture, the rapture come now. Well, yeah, it'd be nice if the rapture comes now. But what about the ones that are left behind? See, God wills, First, Second Peter 3, 9, God wills no man perish. That's his will. He can't change a person's will, but that's what he wills. So if we do our part, Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, he said, lift up your eyes and look, for the fields are white for harvest. There's so many people out there, you, they may be an enemy to you. They may be the most thor, thorn in your flesh. Just irritates the stuffings out of you. God doesn't want them to go to hell. God wants, them, God wants them to turn around, get their life turned around. He wants them to be a child of God. In fact, I've, I've told this before, but Lester Summerall, when he was 17 years old, he had tuberculosis, <clears throat> given up to die, and he had a vision. He saw the Bible in a casket. The Lord said, choose. A 70, he didn't know nothing about nothing. He never went to church. He said, I choose the Bible. God healed him. So, so to honor that, and he started going out back in those days, they would go to country schools. That's where they had their schools, like Little House on the Prairie, and the church there on Sundays. He would go there, have a meeting. People was, and he was not eloquent in speech. He didn't know what he was talking about. They would laugh at him. He'd say, go to hell. He'd get up and leave. He'd go to a different place. The same thing, he'd say, oh, go to hell, because they were rejecting him. One day he had a vision. He saw this wide road. He saw all kinds of people on this road, Orientals and all kinds of people. Who walked to the end of that road, it dropped right off. It dropped off into hell. He saw what was going to happen when he kept telling. He never told people to go to hell after that again. He started. To see, he saw what hell was like. He saw the torment and the punishment. So he changed his vocabulary. So God, God doesn't want anybody to perish, even though some people he like to. Slap them, punch them, do something with them, you know. But anyway, God still loves them. So what God what God desires, and we're supposed to go forth, be be fruitful. And He told 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 Adam, and replenish the earth, refill the earth with sons and daughters of God. 
Because the sooner the kingdom is prepared, Jesus will return for the church or take us up. Then that's getting ready for the end. So we're getting close. So, but we're supposed to do our part, and God will do his part. People, people keep waiting for God to do something. No, God's waiting for you and I to do something. God, why don't you do something? Brother, Brother Hagen uh, tells a story about his brother, Dub. Dub was kind of a character in fights, brawls, and drunk, you know. <laughs> he was kind of rowdy. And Brother Hagen kept praying for him to get saved. And, and uh, Brother Hagen asked the Lord, he said, Lord, I'm praying, praying you do something to get my brother saved. He said, I've been trying. He said, you've been praying wrong for one thing. He started claiming his brother for the kingdom of God, bond the devil from him. Within about three weeks, his brother got saved. I tell you, we're praying people get saved. God's trying to save them. We got to do our part. What's God telling you? So, I guess I can close with that. Let's, let's, I hope you got something out of that. I'm trying to get back. What is man? Who are you in Christ Jesus? Who are you as a child of God? You're the head, not the tail, but not the beneath. You're a winner. You and I aren't losers. The only loser around here really is the devil. The devil's trying to take many people with him as he can in eternal tor torment, punishment. So, phew. I guess we'll <clears throat> do communion this morning. And uh, for, for those that uh, want to partake, they're listening in, watching in. Uh, we always read First Corinthians chapter eleven, but the, the, again, it's not what church you belong to; it's what family you belong to. And it, the only stipulation, really, is that you're, if you accept Christ as your Savior. So, if you haven't, it's very simple; it doesn't cost you a penny. If you if you're not quite sure, you know, the question I ask people, or what we should be asking people. Thank you. If you died today, are you going to heaven? And you can ask people who have been in church most of their lives or all their lives, and they'll say, I hope so. No. Then you're, then you're, if you don't know for sure where you're going, because Romans 8, Romans 8, 16 says, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are the sons of God. So in your, your head may not quite under, comprehend it, but in, in your heart of hearts, you know that you're a child of God. If you never made that confession, just say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I accept Jesus as my Savior, Jesus Come into my heart, be my Savior, and be my Lord now. I receive you, and I thank you, Father. I'm a child of the Most High God right now, and Jesus is my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. That's that simple. <clears throat> and verse 23 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup in the new covenant, in my blood, this do as often as you do it, drink, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks of this cup in an unworthy manner will be, be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, which we're going to do here in a second. For let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner in other words, if you don't belong, you if you sin and haven't confessed the sins, first John one seven nine, which we're going to do. But uh, then he goes on to say, for this reason, for this cause, many are sick, many are weak, and many die. So we don't want to be in a position where we're taking communion as a just a ritual. It doesn't mean anything, but it does. It's most important. Jesus ordained it, and so what we need to do is, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we confess every sin, known and unknown. Father God, to you, whether it be intentional or uh, we didn't realize, you know, sin is, yeah, we knew it, we knew it, did it. But Father God, uh, for what we should do and what we haven't done, Father God, uh, we, we repent of those things in the name of Jesus. And now to you, Father God, we confess these sin or sins, Father God, before you now in Jesus' name.
So, Father, we thank you. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, your word says, if we confess our sins, you're just to forgive us and cleanse us from all sin and all unrighteousness. That means our sins, your word declares in Psalm 103, our sins is, our sins are thrown as far as the east and the west are remembered no more. East and west never meet. But we know that by the blood of Jesus Christ, our sins are totally obliviated. They're, they're annihilated. They're, there's nothing. They're not there anymore. So, Father God, we thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the cleansing power of the blood. So Jesus said it as he took the bread. And what Jesus, by every stripe on his body, he took the price, he paid the price, and wore it for every sickness and disease and pain. Jesus bore it all. So, dear Lord Jesus, for what you did for us, we accept what your, your stripes on your body. We, ex, we ex, accept the bruising, the whippings that you took and the scourging just for us, Lord Jesus Christ. And we can walk in divine health. We can be healed. We want to thank you and praise you now, Lord Jesus. I'll break and eat. <clears throat> in like manner he took the cup Father we thank you for the precious blood of Jesus he said Jesus said this was his blood so we thank you that this juice reminds us of the blood of Jesus Christ represents his shed blood Father we remind you that we are in blood covenant with you and Satan in Jesus name we're blood bought blood washed blood covered blood protected Take your hands off us. We're, we're blood covenant sons and daughters of the Most High God. So, Father, we thank you for the cleansing power. We thank you, Father God, for the whiteness. We are now in your presence, Father God. We've been washed white as snow. So, Father, we thank and praise you now. In Jesus' name, I'll partake. We'll <clears throat> take up our tithes and offerings. Uh, does anybody need prayer this morning? Well, here we're always we'll pray for people that are listening in. Okay. <clears throat> so, as we uh, take up our tithes, Father God, according to your word, we see in Malachi chapter 3, it says, we're, we're in will a man rob God, and Father God, we choose not to rob you, Father God. You said we could prove you in this area. Father, you said that uh, you would cause our fruit not to fall from the vine early. We said, uh, Father God, that we be the head, not the tail in the area. Father God, we thank you that we will have a good, bountiful harvest. <clears throat> we see in Hebrews chapter 7 that Jesus Christ is our great high priest who ever liveth to receive tithes and offerings. So as we take up our tithes and offerings today, we will present it to our Lord Jesus Christ. We will magnify and glorify our Heavenly Father. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> <clears throat> Fathers, Jesus took the five loaves and, and the two fishes. Father God, we, we lift this up to you, Father, now in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the seed that is sown. We thank you, Father God, for our rich, full bounty for harvest. We know that they took up 12 loaves, 12 baskets full, Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which fed 5,000 men, not including women or children. So, Father God, you are a God of multiplication. We thank you for multiplying the seed that is sown now. We pray over the seed, Father, in Jesus' name, and we expect a full Rich, bountiful harvest in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So, Father, as we close the service today, Father God, we just uh, lift up every person within the sound of my voice, every person that's here. Father God, we would ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you would stretch forth your hand, Acts 4 and 30. That whatever need they have, if you have a physical need this morning, whether it be in your head, your body, your chest, your legs, or whatever it might be, your feet, Touch that spot now, Father. We thank you, Father God, as Acts 4 and 3, as you stretch forth your hand because the Holy Spirit is ever-present. He's all over. The Holy Spirit is still the performer of, the, of your word, Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you. And, Father God, we worship you. We thank you for magnifying Jesus Christ, glorifying him through the healings and the deliverance and restoration in people's bodies, Father God, right now in Jesus' name, from the top of their head, the soles of their feet, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, be healed. Amen and amen. Well, you're dismissed. Don't forget Wednesday night, I'll be teaching on healing again.